Hi, this is Melinda Henneberger, Editor-in-Chief of Roll Call. Welcome to the first episode of Roll Call Roundtable. Every week we'll be discussing what's coming up in the week ahead. And today, Monday, we have a great piece from Lindsay McPherson, who covers the house for us. And today she has a piece I really want to talk to her about that she put in a lot of work on, and it really shows, in my opinion, uh, called the Cancer Caucus. And, Lindsay, can you tell us a little bit about what it is? Yes. um, I interviewed seven members of Congress about their experiences with cancer. Some of them have had it personally, been personally diagnosed. Some have had family members go through a diagnosis. Um, Some have lost their family members to cancer. Some have survived. Just very different experiences. And I also talked to them about the policy challenges um, that they face in trying to battle cancer and how it really just brings them together on a bipartisan level the way some other issues don't. And this issue is really in the news now. Talk a little bit about why that is. Right. The president announced in his State of the Union that he would be tasking Vice President Joe Biden with leading a task force, the Moonshot Task Force, as they're calling it, to try to find cures for cancer and basically in the span of five years do what they could have done in a decade in terms of research and trying to find cures for the various forms of cancer. One thing that really struck me is how different all these stories are. And of course, cancer, we now know, is not one disease, but hundreds. And listening to the president talk about the moonshot and later the vice president, that's one thing I wonder about is is how we'll be able to come together to battle what's not one disease, but so many. I think these stories really point that out. So just start off with the first one, the lead story on Debbie Wasserman Schultz, what her story is and how it has changed her. Right. Debbie Wasserman Schultz was diagnosed with breast cancer um, back in 2007, and so through 2008, a presidential campaign year where she was very active with the Democratic Party, was going through treatment for that, Um, didn't tell a lot of people that she had cancer at the time, just went about her life, but she had a double mastectomy, had her ovaries removed because even though she didn't have ovarian cancer, she had a genetic mutation called the BRAC2 mutation that made her more susceptible to ovarian cancer in addition to breast cancer, which she learned after she was diagnosed that she had been susceptible, 80% chance uh, with that mutation of breast cancer, 60% chance of ovarian cancer. And it was a ticking time bomb, as she called it, that she learned she had. So what are the implications of that for her children? Her children may also be at risk of carrying the mutation. They can be tested for that gene when they're older, I mean, they don't recommend they get tested as kids because that's a, a heavy weight to bear in Absolutely. terms of learning that you have a, this mutation that makes you at a high risk of cancer. If as adults they get tested and they are carrying the mutation, her daughters will face some difficult choices about whether to do a preemptive double mastectomy and um, remove their ovaries, which it could have profound impact on their ability to raise a family. and Right. Really, do they, yeah, do what they would have done otherwise. Really, the question, if you test positive for that BRCA one or two, is not whether to get the prophylactic mastectomy, but when. So right. it really is. But she has spoken to her children about it. You reported. Yes, they they are aware um, now that they're older. When her when she was going through this, they were pretty young, and so they knew she was sick, um, but they didn't quite know what was up. But now that they're older, they're you know, and they're. Um, preteen and teenage years, they are aware of the mutation and the fact that they might, like their mom, be at risk one day. And so they've asked her, when do we get tested? I think they have a little anxiety about it. Um, And she tries to, you know, tell them not to worry about it right now, but I'm sure it weighs heavily on her mind and certainly did when she was telling me about her story. I was really impressed to read in your story that she never missed a single vote when she was going through treatment. That's yeah, that's, that's something. A lot, and that, I mean, not that Congress does a lot of work, but there are a lot of votes. <laughs> for, <laughs> and that's, that is impressive. I mean, I'm sure there are some days she's going through a treatment where she just felt nauseous from the treatments. and just. But she, she did her job. Unbeknownst to a lot of people, when she decided to announce after, you know, in 2009 that she had had cancer, she hadn't told anyone but close family and her roommates and the staff that needed to help her get the surgeries. And how has it changed her as a, as a person and as a lawmaker? 
I mean, as a person, I think she's more conscious about, like, spending time with her family. She missed a lot of time with them during that year because she was getting treated up here in Washington so she could do her job, obviously trying to ease her kids' fears about that. But as a lawmaker, she's definitely focused on cancer. When she announced that she had breast cancer, when she decided to tell her story, she did it with legislation that would help raise awareness for other women who face higher risks of breast cancer. Um, just started, a, it's called the Early Act, and they created a um, task force to look into education awareness, and there was funding dedicated toward that. Okay. Uh, the next one you wrote about was Billy Long, whose daughter had cancer, and, and of course, that's a very different situation. How did he react to that? He wanted to trade places with her, he said, when he had learned the news. She was 26, so she wasn't a child. But her father, he wanted to do anything he could to make her feel better better and he wished he could have traded places with her. It was a scary time um, for them because she had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but they initially called her and told her that she had Hodg Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is oh, a nice. more serious. Mm. Um, so there's a few hours there where obviously they didn't know if it was going to be more serious than it was. And even still, like, you know, you don't know that like what he said basically is, you know, the first few weeks were really impactful on him. He missed, he had never missed a vote the prior um, Congress, but he took two weeks off, um, didn't come to work, didn't even talk to anyone. He said he couldn't deal with it. It was just very emotional for him. And I'm sure for Kelly, too. Right. And so coming out of that, how does how does he look at the potential for research and for this moonshot? Now that she's been through treatment and her PET scans have come back clean her last two, um, I think he sees how thankful he is that there was a lot of research in the area of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I think he acknowledges that there's a lot of work to be done on other cancers. And he's hopeful that, you know, the moonshot, the 21st century care bill that the House passed in July that the Senate is looking at now, that those type of things can help find cures and advance research for other forms of cancer as well so that other people like his daughter can go through it and come out of it and go back to living a healthy, normal life. Unfortunately, there's so many people touched by this disease. It may be the rare area of bipartisan agreement where so many people have had a personal experience where they would really feel that committed to this. So another one is, is Donald Payne Jr. And, and when I first came to Washington about 20 years ago, I covered his father who died of cancer. And so speak a little bit about his situation. Right. His father had not been screened early enough for colorectal cancer. And so by the time it was discovered, it was in the later stages. And he passed in 2012. Donald Payne Jr. was with Donald Payne Sr. It was Super Bowl night. He was telling me um, his dad had been having to take his temperature because he was sick from the cancer. Um, per the doctor's orders, and he would always notice his dad would always go take a sip of water before he took his temperature. And so he told him that night, as he saw him about to go do the same thing, he's like, don't don't drink anything. And he did it. He took his temperature, and it was over 100, and he, they called the doctor, and they said, go to the hospital immediately. And he told me he went in the hospital, and he never came back out. He passed a month later, and it was really unfortunate. And so for him, I mean, now he's he, anywhere he goes, he said, it, he literally told me, two or more people, and I will tell you the importance of getting screened for colorectal mm -hmm. cancer. Did he feel that his dad was either consciously or subconsciously taking a drink of cold water to suppress the fever so that he wouldn't have to get any bad news about having a fever that might indicate a problem? He didn't specify that, but he did, I mean, it seemed to suggest, like, that it was... Wasn't a, yeah, a not, total accident. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then we have Chuck Fleischman, uh, who's, who's, both of his parents died of cancer, right? Yes. His mother died when he was really young. He was 13 when she died, um, nine when she was diagnosed. So saw her in pain for a few years from breast cancer. And the advancements weren't as they are today, where Debbie Washerman Schultz was able to get treated. I thought it was a little more difficult. Um, she went through one round and came out of it, and then the cancer came back. That, that ended up being the fatal round for her. But as a young boy, it was really difficult. Um, his dad like, didn't die until he was an adult, but he talked a lot about his mother's experience and the impact that had because his dad was moving around a lot for work economically. Um, he had to move a lot, and he was kind of the sole caretaker of the household. He, he didn't go to his high school prom. He never got to play high school sports. He had a real profound impact on his life growing up. Sure. And his dad's too, actually. His dad learned basically that 
you know, he he viewed ever since that experience with his mother, his wife, well, his wife, but um, with Chuck Fleischman's mother that he felt like cancer was a death sentence. And so every, every time in his life after that, he learned someone had cancer, he would feel like they were going to die. And that didn't always happen. But then, so when he was diagnosed, I think he was in his 80s, with esophageal cancer, he was like, this is it. This is not going to make it. And that's a horrible thing to think. I'm sure a lot of people think that, but it was partially shaped by the experience with his wife. And he unfortunately did not make it. That used to be true that it was a lot more, obviously, of a death sentence than is now the case. And we hope that with this this new push for research will be even less so in the future. The The last story that you highlighted was from Kevin McCarthy and really showed a different side of him than I had ever read anything about. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, Kevin McCarthy lost his father 16 years ago and to cancer, obviously. And he doesn't talk about his dad much, I was told. Um, so it was kind of <laughs> difficult to secure the interview, but he agreed to sit down. And once he did, he was happy to open up. He loved his father so much. He was by his side as he was going through cancer. He said he only missed one treatment um, the entire time he was going through it. He was always there. His dad uh, was getting treated in the same building in which he works, so during his lunch break, he'd go play cards with them. As he was kind of jump back and forth through the story of his dad, I noticed that he was highlighting a lot of ups, but a lot of downs, and it was just, it's just kind of bumpy ride, and I think that's what a lot of people go through, and it just really resonated how profoundly it impacts you both positively and negatively because I think That's he's right. got a lot of a different outlook on life. He says he tells his kids and his wife he loves them every day. That's something he did with his father after he learned he was diagnosed. And tell tell about the trip that he he gave as a present to his dad. I was really touched by that. Oh yeah, he said his dad had never been to Ireland and always wanted to go, and he had never got to fly first class and always wanted to do that. And this was before Kevin McCarthy was Kevin and, McCarthy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's not like. He was rich or anything. He said he'd saved up a bunch of miles to buy his mom and his dad a plane ticket to Ireland um, for first class. So they got to fly first class, go to Ireland, kiss the Blarney Stone. They also um, went to London and were scheduled to go to Italy. But unfortunately, in London, he got ill and had to come back. And that's kind of where the slow downward spiral happened for him. But at least he had that last trip. In the story overall, what was the biggest surprise for you reporting it? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. I think certainly learning things like that, that you just don't know about these people that you report on. Kevin McCarthy is someone as I cover house leadership. I cover him on a day-to-day basis. And I've never, like you said, I've never seen this side of him. Also just how much the stories are, even though they're so very different in terms of what type of cancer and how it, that the common themes are there. And that I think that they all talk to constituents about this in a common way, and they think they all have common goals. And I'm such a pessimist covering Congress these days, <laughs> but this is one of those stories that gives you a little bit of optimism that something can get done. Do you feel like it's brought them together um, as people, that, that they have formed relationships as a result of having they, this in common? They definitely have. I asked them all that. Kevin McCarthy's saying, oh, yeah, over dinner we share stories like that, and we're colleagues, but we're also, you know, friendly to one another and learn a lot. Excellent. Really good. Thanks. And I hope everyone will read your wonderful story. I really learned a lot myself. Thank you. So next we're going to talk to our White House reporter, John Bennett, who has been carefully monitoring what might happen with the Obama's nomination of uh, someone to take the place of Justice Scalia, who we know died recently. What, what are you hearing that may happen this week, John? Well, hearing that uh, this could very well be the week, obviously, um, you know, the president could decide he's not quite ready, he's not quite sure, and, you know, this could slip uh, another week or two. But strong indications that we could get a nominee this week. And I, it really seems like the consensus out there is the president is going to try to find someone uh, kind of considered a moderate, as he puts it, with impeccable legal credentials, and not someone who, you know, is is branded w- as a very liberal justice or a liberal uh, legal scholar. And the the play here for the White House is, is twofold. They do want to get a nominee. They want to get someone confirmed. Um, so even though that person would be moderate, they would still lean left and usually vote uh, with the more moderate justices. But the bigger play here is, is about the election, just like everything else that we're covering right now. And by sending up someone moderate with a great legal reputation, 
do- doesn't have controversial speeches or decisions or uh, writings that are out there from any point in their career, that could really put Republicans in a bind, both congressional Republicans and, uh, you know, the eventual presidential nominee for the, for the party. And even down the ballot, it could this could very easily put the Senate in play if voters view Mitch McConnell, the, the Senate Republican leader, as blocking what otherwise would be a Supreme Court nomination that other than maybe some tough questions at a hearing or two would sail through with, you know, 90 plus votes. And that that appears to be what the White House is is thinking as of now. I saw some polling today that showed that two out of three Americans would like to see the seat filled by President Obama So in the next year. So, yes, that definitely is a chance Republicans will take if they decide not to hear from anyone. If you had to guess, tell us a little bit about the war gaming, the timing you said this week, but is there any time in particular you think is more or less likely? Just uh, glancing at, at the schedule this week, <laughs> Uh, Tuesday is taken up with a visit um, from the Irish leader who is uh, leaving early. So all of that interaction, it, it's an annual uh, St. Patrick's Day uh, event at the White House, and is now... visit to Obama. Right. O, uh, o apostrophe Obama, right. Um, everything surrounding St. Patrick's Day at the White House will now happen on Tuesday. And the schedule looks pretty jammed on Tuesday. There's really no time for a big event um, including he's going to travel up to the Capitol for the usual uh, St. Patrick's Day festivities. But Monday morning is wide open. He doesn't. Have, he goes to the State Department, I believe, around noon for an event. And Monday morning is wide open. I can't stress that enough. As are Thursday and Friday, uh, meetings at the White House is all we have right now. The question I have about Thursday and Friday, the Senate may already be gone, and Obama leaves for Cuba on Sunday, and he's gone most of the week. He's going to Argentina after that. And the Senate is out um, the following week as well. And you you probably want to do it while they're here, let them get it out of their system, talking to folks like us, running around, sticking recorders in in Republicans' faces. You don't want to do it while they're gone. So doing it Monday gives the Senate a full week to, to opine. Okay, very good. So, David Hawkins, you have been writing about the politics of this nomination, and what have you been hearing about um, what the Republicans in the Senate are thinking at this point and how they like their chances of of staving off a nomination this year? Oh, they like their chances, and I think they are pretty well locked in place with this strategy that uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell announced within two hours of Antonin Scalia's death on on, uh, that Saturday, February 13th. Uh, McConnell said, not only are we not going to confirm whoever President Obama sends us, we're not going to have a hearing, and we might not even uh, invite them in for coffee for the usual, what are called the walkabouts or the courtesy visits. Generally, the president sends, uh, sends his Supreme Court nominees to Capitol Hill. They literally go from office to office. They shake hands. They pose for photographs. They have a brief, uh, pleasant chat, and then they move on to the next office. The Republicans have said, no point in even doing that. We would just assume not entertain these pe- this person because he or she is never going to get out of the starting gate with us. They seem locked in on this, and it, uh, and it seems as though they have concluded uh, that whatever uh, criticism they take from the public for being obstructionist and for resorting to the old partisan rhythms, they are is, is more than offset by the fact that they're appealing to their base, they're rallying re- Republican conservatives, and that's more important to them than furthering their reputation as obstructionists. I can understand doing that. I can't really understand saying that right off the bat. I can understand finding fault with each and every nominee more than I can saying from the outset, there's no one good is going to be good enough for us if it's someone named by this president. I, Again, I, that's to stir up the base. I, I sort of I, I agree with you. I, it seemed as though I mean the cynical view would be to to do it without saying it, to say or even to say the opposite. Say, oh, we look forward to to hearing from the president who he thinks is the best nominee, and we'll give that person every due consideration. Yada yada yada, and then, <laughs> and then they just slow walk it into oblivion. I don't understand 
quite honestly why that wasn't their strategy. The only thing I can think of is, and John makes the important point about the timing of when senators are in town versus when they're not. When senators are not in town, it is hard. It is even in this modern world of emails and, and texting, it's hard to get 54 politicians on the same page with their talking points when they're not physically in the same building. And so McConnell felt compelled, it seems, on that, on that Saturday when Scalia died to make a very quick, bold move that would essentially lock his team in place before they, the other 53 of them who were scattered around the country, could come up with slightly different talking points and, and present a slightly less unified uh, mm-hmm. front. So it seemed as though this was McConnell's only – he concluded strategically that he had to really nail this down with a very large hammer right away. It sounded like an echo of what he said right after the president was sworn in that his first uh, priority, top priority, was going to be making Barack Obama a one-term president. That's right. And it, it's also important to remember that, that to sort of echo what I said a minute ago, that McConnell's constituency, he has two very different constituencies. His long-term play is to retain the Senate and to remain majority leader. But his short-term play is to not infuriate the Republican, the conservative Republican base, who has been suspicious of him all along. The the super conservative Tea Party right has never really thought of McConnell as a genuine ally. They thought him as a little bit squishy on some issues. And so this was his way of, yes, just as he said, hoping to keep Obama as the one-term president, his saying this was designed to to hold any any internal criticism of him on the hard Republican right at bay. What about the concern that this strategy may lead to a more liberal uh, justice in the end if a Democrat wins the White House? That seems to, at the moment, be the risk they're willing to take. Um, I have also uh, had some senators tell me, and I wrote a piece about this a couple of weeks ago, that there is still the opportunity for the Senate to eventually buckle. So there's a long time between now and November. There's also two months between November and the start of the next Congress and the arrival of the new president. So if it comes to pass uh, that a Democrat wins the White House, uh, and if the Republicans could still say, ah, this judge that President Obama sent us in March, now he he or she looks pretty good compared to what we might get from a President Sanders or a President Hillary Clinton, let's just go ahead and confirm him or her anyway and be done with it because it'll only get more ideologically bad for us if we wait until the new president arrives. You know McConnell really well, so do you see him backtracking? Do you see that being a, a difficult move for him if he does feel for some reason that he has to, to change course? Oh, I do. I think I think he is um, he's definitely all about the politics of the possible and what works best for him and his team on any given day. So if he concludes in November or December that this is what the Republicans need to do, I mean, Lordy, what it might be the case that uh, remember that the Senate goes Democratic in November. We, we our colleague Stu Rothenberg, our right. chief political analyst, now says it's. He used to say it was possible the Senate would go Democratic. Now this week, in the probable. past week, he said he's changed that to a probable. So maybe if the uh, if the Senate turns Democratic on November eighth, then once again McConnell might say, well, we have our chance now to confirm this semi-centrist, semi-moderate person nominated to. A, to bait us into into accepting this person. Let's go ahead and accept this person anyway, because, again, it'll only get worse next year when we don't have any control over the process. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for joining us for our first episode of Roll Call Roundtable. I'm Melinda Henneberger, editor of Roll Call. Please check out our brand new site, rollcall.com, or follow us on Twitter at Roll Call. <laughs>